four different protein shapes. And what we're looking at are subsequently more complex shapes when we look at these protein shapes. This shape right here is called the primary structure. And essentially what this is, is a string of amino acids. You can see A1, A2, A3, and so on. Those are individual amino acids hooked by peptide bonds. Okay. But what's going to happen is this string of amino acids and all of the the side chains or the R groups, those radical groups, they're going to interact with one another and form bonds. Right? Some of them will be hydrogen bonds. And that will cause this primary structure, this string of amino acids, to fold and twist and turn. And again, this is because of the interactions between the R groups. So you can make an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. Okay? Essentially, uh, these strings of amino acids will uh, bend in a way to make a flattened structure. All right, these two protein shapes are examples of secondary structures of protein. All right, now if we get more complex folding, we're going to get to the tertiary structure. So you can see. Uh, the secondary structure here and that secondary structure has folded on itself to make a more complex shape, right? So this is actually one of the subunits of hemoglobin. You can see the hemoglobin molecule over here, right? Now this hemoglobin molecule is a quaternary structure because what's going to happen here is we're going to take multiple tertiary structures and hook them together to make an even more complex protein. Okay, This is an example of hemoglobin right here. This is a globular protein. We can also have fibrous proteins here like this collagen, or it could even be keratin. It looks very similar. The two look very similar to one another. So this is a fibrous protein. And again, it's made of multiple tertiary structures stuck together. So here we're going to look at how enzymes catalyze reactions, or in other words, how enzymes are going to make reactions go. Okay, Enzymes are proteins. Enzymes are going to be coded for in the DNA. And enzymes are going to be specific for catalyzing specific chemical reactions. Okay. Molecules to be synthesized are going to have to fit into specific active sites right here. So we're going to have substrates or reactants binding to these active sites on the enzyme so that the enzyme can help make the reaction go or help to bind these substrates together. Now, these active sites are only going to allow certain substances to bind to them, and they'll allow substances with the same shaped key to bind, right? So this is kind of a lock and key type mechanism here where this key right here is only going to fit this lock. This key right here does not fit this lock over here because this lock doesn't have the same shape. Right? So this key only fits this lock. This key right here only fits this lock. This substrate can only bind at this active site, and this substrate can only bind at this active site. Now, once the substrates or reactants bind to the active sites, they'll be in close proximity to one another so that the enzyme can facilitate the binding of these two substances to form a product. Right? And the product is the result of binding the reactants or the substrates together. Okay? Now, functions of an enzyme. One of the functions is to lower activation energy. We'll see on the next slide how enzymes are going to decrease the amount of energy you have to add to a chemical reaction in order to make it go. Okay? Also, Enzymes are going to allow us to release energy in small steps. They're going to break little pieces of molecules off when enzymes are used to break molecules apart. Right? 
one, we can have an enzyme, a separate enzyme from this one, but an enzyme that would make the chemical reaction go back in this direction so that we can break this uh, substance down into smaller products. Okay? Now, there are certain things that have an effect on enzyme function. That's pH. One of the things is pH. Right? If the pH of the solution that the enzyme is in is not optimal, that's going to mess with the function of the enzyme. So, for example, let's say the pH is too acidic, the pH is low. Okay? That would tend to denature the protein or make this protein structure unravel. And when that happens, the active sites are destroyed. So those active sites won't be able to bind to specific substrates to cause the chemical reaction to take place. Okay. So enzymes need to have the proper pH in order to function correctly. Enzymes also need the proper temperatures to function correctly. If the temperature gets too high, then what happens is the enzyme gets denatured. Okay. And that destroys the active sites, rendering the enzyme functionless. Okay. If the temperature is too low, right, that decreases the kinetic energy in the solution, so it takes longer for the substrates to make their way to the enzyme so that the chemical reaction can take place. Concentrations of enzymes are also important. If we only have one enzyme working to bind the substrates together, we're only going to get products being produced at a slower rate. But if we have a high concentration of enzymes, more enzymes present, then what's going to happen is we'll be able to produce products more quickly. And then finally, time is important. We have to allow enough time to pass in order for the substrates to find the enzyme, bind to the enzyme in this chemical reaction to get carried out. Now, we also have this term on here, denature. I mentioned what denature means before. Denaturing is when uh, the complex protein structure gets destroyed. The protein gets unraveled, broken down to its primary structure. Okay. If we're talking about an enzyme, that would render the enzyme functionless. It would destroy the active sites and the enzyme wouldn't be able to bind the substrates. Okay. Denaturing a protein is also important for digestion of that protein. If the protein is in a globular complex form like this, it's harder to digest. But acids in the stomach will help to denature proteins, break them down to their primary structure so that enzymes can get in and cleave off amino acids from the protein to digest it. This slide right here shows a graph of activation energy. Here we've got on the x-axis the progress of a chemical reaction and on the y-axis, the amount of energy that goes into making that chemical reaction happen. And when you've got a chemical reaction taking place, you take substrates or reactants, make them react with one another in order to get a more stable product. Right? Now, in order to get the reactants to go to products, you need to add activation energy. Okay. Now, this dotted line right here represents the amount of activation energy that's required to make this generic chemical reaction take place. Okay. That's without an enzyme. This is the amount of energy that you have to add to the reaction to make it go. Right. This translates into heat. Right. This would increase body temperature so much that you could denature the proteins in the body. We don't want that to happen. So, lucky for us, nature has developed enzymes. And what enzymes do, again, is lower the activation energy so we don't have to add extra energy and increase body temperature in order to get chemical reactions to go. The take-home message here is that enzymes lower the activation energy. Next, we're going to talk about other macromolecules of biological importance, molecules like nucleotides, ATP, and nucleic acids. So this slide right here, we're going to be dealing with nucleotides. Okay. 
Now, nucleotides are going to consist of a sugar. Now, in this picture right here, we can see the sugar is going to be a deoxyribose sugar in this case. You've probably heard of deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA. Right? That's where the D comes from. It's this deoxyribose sugar. So a nucleotide consists of a sugar. And that sugar can be a deoxyribose sugar or a ribose sugar. Remember, there's RNA too, and RNA has a ribose sugar here instead of deoxyribose. So nucleotides consist of a sugar. They also consist of a phosphate group. And here we've got a phosphate group attached to the deoxyribose sugar in this case. Right? So nucleotides also will contain a nitrogenous base. Here you can see thymine is the nitrogenous base. On this nucleotide over here, we're gonna see adenine and those two will bind to one another by way of a hydrogen bond. All right now the nitrogenous bases, there's two different types of nitrogenous bases. There's the purines and the pyrimidines. All right here we can see the purines up here. We've got adenine and guanine, A and G. Right? And those adenine and guanine molecules, uh, you can see their structure um, here. Don't worry about being able to write out this chemical structure. It's not important, but uh, it is here to show the complexity of this molecule. Right? And the pyrimidines are down here. We've got cytosine and thymine. Those would be found in DNA. In RNA, we're going to take the thymine away and replace it with uracil. And you can see how very similar those molecules are. But this is the third component of a nucleotide. Again, sugar, deoxyribose could be ribose and RNA. We've got a phosphate group and then we've got the nitrogenous bases, purines or pyrimidines. Here we've got ATP at the bottom of this slide. And ATP like I've mentioned in earlier classes, ATP is the energy currency in the body, right? If you wanna do something in the body, you use ATP. Just like if you wanna go downtown and hang out in Syracuse, right? In order to do something down there, you need to have money, you need to have some sort of currency. So again, ATP is the energy currency in the body, right? Now, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, okay? Here you can see the molecule down here. There's an adenosine component. There's three phosphates, one, two, three, triphosphate. Now, this molecule, like I said, supplies energy to fuel many of the processes in the body. We're gonna see how ATP is going to help to pump ions across a membrane. We're also going to see how ATP is involved in muscle contraction this semester. Okay. Now, ATP is split in order to form ADP and an extra phosphate. This little I right here represents that this phosphate is inorganic. It's an inorganic separate phosphate from the main molecule. Okay. Now, the reason we split ATP into ADP and the phosphate, and by the way, ADP stands for adenosine diphosphate, the reason we do this is because there's a lot of energy in this end bond right here. Okay. And so when we break that bond, we release that energy, and that energy can be used to do things in the body. Okay. So... Energy is released when that end bond is split. There are other nucleotides uh, in the body. Um, this one right here we deal with uh, a lot, but there are others like GTP. They can donate a phosphate to ADP, for example, so that we get ATP made, right? GTP stands for guanosine triphosphate. It's a similar molecule to this. Another nucleotide is cyclic AMP, right? And that's part of the second messenger system in a cell that we'll talk about later when we get to uh, cell structure and function. And here we have nucleic acids, right? Nucleic acids are chains of nucleotides, 
I remember a couple slides ago, we talked about what nucleotides were. There was the sugar, the phosphate, and the nitrogenous base. Well, we can string those nucleotides together to make nucleic acids, right? Deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, is a nucleic acid. Now, an interesting thing about these molecules, these nucleic acids, is they'll store information at the molecular level. That's kind of interesting. Now, the DNA bases, remember we talked about adenine and thymine, guanine and cytosine. All of those are DNA bases. Those are nitrogenous bases. And what they're going to do, you can see right here, they're going to pair up with one another and hook together. The A's and the T's will bind to one another, adenine and thymine. The guanines and the cytosines will bind to one another, and they bind by making hydrogen bonds. And these hydrogen bonds are easy to break so that we can separate these DNA strands so that we can duplicate the DNA so that we can make proteins, and we'll talk about that a little later. DNA is a nucleic acid, deoxyribo, because of the sugar, deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA is also a nucleic acid, ribonucleic acid, because of the ribose sugar that would be in this place right here instead of the deoxyribose. So RNA bases include Uracil. We replace thymine, get that off the list, and replace it with uracil if we're dealing with RNA. That's one of the things that distinguishes a DNA molecule from an RNA molecule. So if you look at a string of nucleotides making a nucleic acid and you don't see any thymines in there, but you see uracils, you'll know you'll de you're dealing with RNA. Next, we're going to shift gears a little bit and start talking about the cell. So what we've done is taken our atoms, hooked them together to make molecules. Now we're going to take these molecules that we talked about, hook them together to make organelles, which is a term that literally means tiny organ. And those tiny organs or organelles are going to have specific functions within a cell. Right? So, again, we're slowly building and building and building up to those organs and organ systems that we're going to study this semester. Cell theory. This is a theory that says that cells are the building blocks of all plants and animals. Right? This is the story we're going with at this point in time based on the technology that's been developed in order to see cells, right? Later on in time, we could develop other technology that would detect something else that we can't see now that would change this theory. But at this point in time, this is the story we're going with. So it's called a theory until it can be disproven. So the cell theory states that cells are the building blocks of all plants and animals. Cells come from the division of pre-existing cells. They don't just appear out of nowhere. Right? Early scientists thought that things appeared out of nowhere. They didn't realize there were stages in uh, organisms' life cycles that they couldn't see. There were major advances in science when microscopes were developed by Robert Hooke back in 1665. Right? Until then, Things that were less than a tenth of a millimeter in size couldn't be seen. Right? So those were outside of people's consciousness, those structures that were smaller than a tenth of a millimeter. Right? Now, he discovered that things were made of cells because of his development of this technology known as the microscope. And he called those things cells because they looked like the small rooms in a prison. Also a component of the cell theory states that cells are the smallest units that perform all vital physiological functions. 
and each cell is responsible for maintaining homeostasis at the cellular level. So all of our cells work together in our body to help maintain this internal balance in order to help maintain homeostasis. Each cell contributes to the cause, all right? And when you sum up the contributions of all the cells in the body, that helps to maintain homeostasis for the overall organism. Overall homeostasis reflects the combined and coordinated actions of many different cells in the body. The components of a cell membrane consist of the phospholipid bilayer that makes up about 70% of the membrane lipids. In here we can see this double layer of phospholipids, the phospholipid bilayer making the cell membrane. But we also have other components of a cell membrane. We've got cholesterol as part of the cell membrane. And here we can see the cholesterol looking like these little uh, pieces of corn <laughs> embedded in the cell membrane. Okay. Cholesterol accounts for about 20% of membrane lipids. So here you can see fats or lipids are really important components of the body. They're really important components of the cell. And we're going to see how important the cell membrane is to our cells and the function of our cells and the function of our body as a whole. Okay. Now, cell membranes also have proteins embedded in the cell membrane. And here we can see some examples of the proteins that are embedded in the cell membrane. Okay. And there's some proteins down here. So the proteins that are embedded in the cell membrane, we've got recognition proteins. Right? Recognition proteins are going to be like name tags on the surface of the cell. Here's an example of a recognition protein, a cell identity marker, okay? A glycoprotein acting as an identity marker, distinguishing the body's own cells from foreign cells. You can see this glycoprotein with the uh, glycolipids attached, and here you can see that uh, as well, too, on this example. But they're going to help to identify the cells as being from the body, okay? Immune cells will patrol the body looking for these recognition proteins. If they find the recognition protein, those immune cells are going to leave the cells alone because that means that those cells are from this body. But if they come across a foreign cell that does not have a recognition protein on it, then those immune cells will destroy those foreign cells. Okay? So recognition proteins. We also have proteins that are going to be receptor proteins, okay? Receptor proteins. And receptor proteins, you can see one down here, receptor proteins are going to be sensitive to ligands. Now, ligands are extracellular molecules that bind to other molecules. It's just a general term. Uh, you can think of a hormone as being a ligand. Now, receptors are going to bind to chemical messengers, such as hormones, that are sent from other cells. So this receptor will receive, essentially, information from other cells in the form of some sort of ligand, like a hormone. Okay? And the binding of these ligands to these receptor proteins will trigger changes in the activity of the cell. Okay. An example of this would be insulin binding to receptor proteins that cause a cell to increase the rate of glucose absorption, for example. Okay. We also have channel proteins. Okay. Now, here's an example of a channel protein. And a channel protein, you can read right here, a channel protein uh, that is constantly open and allows solutes to pass into and out of the cell. All right. What's going to drive the movement of these solutes? 
Well, diffusion will. Diffusion moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. These solute molecules are moving into the cell through this channel protein because the concentration of solute molecules is higher outside. So these channel proteins allow for things to come into the cell and certain things, right? These channel proteins will allow certain things to come through. These channel proteins only have an opening that's so large, so things that are small enough will fit through this channel protein. Larger things won't be able to fit in there. So there's some uh, filtering effect here, if you will. Now carrier proteins are going to help to uh, carry substances across the cell membrane. They have to bind to those substances in order to transport them across the cell membrane. Some carrier proteins might require ATP. An example of that would be a sodium potassium exchange pump that will pump sodium out of a cell and potassium into a cell. You'll see those when we get into nervous system and muscle function. We also have the cytoskeleton, cytoskeleton proteins. In here you can see cytoskeleton proteins down here uh, attaching to integral proteins in the cell membrane. Uh, these cytoskeleton proteins are going to help to support the cell uh, and also uh, these integral proteins are going to attach to the cytoskeletal structures in order to hold the cell membrane to the cytoskeleton. The functions of the cell membrane with all of these components includes physical isolation. Right? The cell membrane is going to isolate the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell so that the chemical reactions that happen outside of the cell won't affect the chemical reactions on the inside of the cell unless we want them to. This cell membrane is going to control that. Right? Physical isolation also exchange. The cell membrane is going to be responsible for exchanging things between the outside and inside of the cell. Right? The cell membrane is going to control that. The cell membrane is also going to be responsible for sensing things outside of the cell. What's going on in the external environment around this cell? The cell membrane is going to detect that. Okay? It's going to be sensitive to those changes outside the cell. And those changes could change the function of the inside of the cell if those changes are detected by the cell membrane, and it's important. And then finally, support. The cell membrane is going to help to support the shape of the cell. Oftentimes, when people talk about cells and talk about the brains of a cell, they often say that the nucleus is the brain of the cell. Right? Now, my opinion is a little bit different than most people's. In my opinion, the brain of the cell is the cell membrane. If you think about the function of the cell membrane and the function of the central nervous system, the central nervous system controls the body. Think about this. Input from the receptors in the nervous system gets sent into the central nervous system, and then the central nervous system figures out what to do with that information and changes what happens in the body. Well, the cell membrane is going to sense what's going on in the external environment around the cell, and that could trigger a change in the physiology or the cellular activity inside the cell because of the complexity of these membranes. Remember, we've got recognition proteins. We've got receptors that will receive ligands from other areas in the body. These receptor proteins, once activated, can change the function of the inside of the cell. So in my mind, the cell membrane acts more like the central nervous system than the nucleus does. The nucleus of the cell, uh, in my mind, is more of a, a library. 
that stores genetic information, that stores the blueprints for protein synthesis. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is a general term for all of the stuff inside the cell or all of the stuff between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. So between the plasma membrane and the nucleus, that's the cytoplasm, right? The cytoplasm is divided up into two components, right? The cytosol, which is the fluid inside the cell, right? The fluid contains things like potassium ions, uh, proteins, um, carbohydrates, lipids, things like that. And the other portion of the cytoplasm would be the organelles. And this term organelle liter literally means tiny organ. Now the extracellular fluid is going to be isolated from the cytoplasm or this intracellular fluid by way of the cell membrane. We talked about that on the previous slide. Now inside the cell, we've got this cytoskeleton. We've got this supporting framework inside the cell in order to give the cell some strength, but also allow some flexibility of the cell too. We're going to need our cells to be flexible because we're going to constantly distort them every time we move our body or pressure is put on our body, things like that. Okay. Now, the cytoskeleton consists of microfilaments. Right? Microfilaments are the smallest component of the cytoskeleton, usually located uh, at the periphery near the cell membrane, okay, these microfilaments, uh, actin, we'll look at the function of actin uh, when we look at the function of a skeletal muscle, right? but actin would be an example of a microfilament. Okay? They help to anchor the cytoskeleton to the integral proteins that are embedded in the cell membrane. Okay? Sometimes these microfilaments will interact with myosin, for example, in order to produce movements. Okay. Another component of the cytoskeleton would be the intermediate filaments. Now the intermediate filaments help to strengthen the cell and maintain the cell's shape. It helps to stabilize the position of organelles, right? hold them in place so they don't move around. And it also helps to stabilize the position of cells relative to other cells. Okay, so those are the intermediate filaments. We also have microtubules. And microtubules are hollow tubes that are made of a protein known as tubulin. Okay? These are the largest components of the cytoskeleton. They give the cell strength, rigidity. They also help to anchor organelles. Um, they're like a monorail system uh, because they're going to uh, help to move vesicles through the cell. Uh, microtubules are associated with the spindle apparatus, and the spindle apparatus is made every time a cell undergoes cell division or mitosis. Okay. And microtubules also form structural components um, of uh, centrioles and cilia. And we're only going to see thick filaments inside muscle cells. Myosin is an example of a thick filament. Right? And actin, which is a microfilament, and myosin, which is a thick filament, those two proteins are going to interact with one another to cause movement. And we'll see that when we get to the skeletal muscles. Now at the heart of the cytoskeleton, we have the centrioles. Okay? Now the centrioles are going to form the cytoskeleton, and they're also going to form the microtubules of the spindle apparatus. Okay, here we can see the centrioles and what they look like when we magnify them. Okay, now centrioles are not found in red blood cells. Centrioles are not found in skeletal muscle cells. Centrioles are not found in cardiac muscle cells, and centrioles are not found in neurons. So 
What this means is these cells cannot undergo mitosis because remember these centrioles are responsible for forming the spindle apparatus that's required in mitosis or cell division. Okay? So red blood cells will not be able to divide. Skeletal muscle will not be able to divide. Cardiac muscle will not be able to divide. And neurons will not be able to divide. Cells divide or undergo mitosis in order to replace cells that are worn out or dying. Okay. So essentially what this means is you're born with all the skeletal muscle cells that you're going to have in your life. You're born with all of the cardiac muscle cells you're going to have in your life. You're born with all the neurons that you're going to have in your life. Right? These red blood cells are going to wear out with time. Right? They'll last for about 180 days before they wear out and we need to produce new red blood cells. But these cells, since they don't have centrioles, they're not going to be able to divide on their own. So this slide deals with some of the surface modifications of our cell membrane to give certain cells certain characteristics. Right? Microvilli, for example. Microvilli are very small structures. They're very small finger-like projections. And you can see some microvilli over here. These are extensions of the cytoplasm. What they're going to do is increase the surface area of the cell membrane. That means we'll be able to put more proteins, more receptors on this extended cell membrane. We're going to find microvilli in places like the digestive tract so that we can absorb more nutrients into the cells. Okay. So microvilli are going to increase the surface area for absorption. Another surface modification would be cilia. And here we can see an example of some cilia on this cell. Cilia are a little bit longer than microvilli. You can see the relative size of the two. Cilia contain microtubules. Because they project from the cell so far, they need some sort of support inside there. Right? Here you can see a cilium right here with some microtubules organized inside the cilium to give it some strength. Cilia are going to move back and forth. They're going to beat rhythmically in order to move fluids. We're going to see cilia in the respiratory system and how they will move dirty mucus out of the respiratory tract to help clean it. We also find cilia in the reproductive tract as well, and those cilia will help to move the egg, for example, in the female reproductive tract. You'll look at that when you study reproductive system in AMP2. Okay. Both of these, microvilli and cilia, are extensions of the cell membrane. Right? Now, flagella, which we only find in the male reproductive tract are not membrane bound. And ribosomes are responsible for making proteins. They're involved in protein synthesis. Ribosomes, you can see by the picture here, consist of two subunits. There's a small ribosomal subunit and a large ribosomal subunit. Okay. What they're going to do is unite with a molecule known as messenger RNA. And we'll talk later about where that messenger RNA strand comes from. That's part of protein synthesis. Right? But what's going to happen is these two subunits are going to surround the messenger RNA. The messenger RNA strand is going to fit through here. And the ribosome is going to read that messenger RNA to try to figure out what amino acids to add to the sequence of amino acids or the string of amino acids that's going to be produced upon protein synthesis. Now, ribosomes consist of ribosomal RNA. About 60% of a ribosome is made by ribosomal RNA, and this ribosomal RNA is made by the nucleolus inside the nucleus. 
Also, ribosomes consist of protein. About 40% of the ribosome is made of protein. Okay. Now, we've got two types of ribosomes. We've got ribosomes that are freely floating through the cytoplasm. They're not bound to anything. They're just floating through. And then we've got ribosomes that are bound to membranes. Right? And we're going to see when we get to the rough endoplasmic reticulum that ribosomes are bound to the membrane of an endoplasmic reticulum to make it rough. Right? Now, endoplasmic reticulum, you can see, consists of these tubes in these flattened cisternae. And what they are is a network of tubes in flattened areas or cisternae that pass through the cell. The endoplasmic reticulum are going to have four functions. Okay? One of those functions is synthesis of molecules. Right? Now, we're going to have two types of endoplasmic reticulum that we'll look at on this slide. We've got this type up here. You can see it's kind of bumpy. It's rough. It looks rough. That's rough endoplasmic reticulum. It has ribosomes attached to it. And this endoplasmic reticulum is going to be responsible for making proteins. Okay? Down here at the bottom you can see this smooth endoplasmic reticulum which doesn't have ribosomes attached. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is going to be responsible for synthesizing other molecules. Molecules like carbohydrates and lipids. So an endoplasmic reticulum inside a cell is going to be responsible for making things. The endoplasmic reticulum is also going to function to store things, store molecules that it makes. Right? These cisternae right here, cisterns, you may have heard of a rain cistern before. Right? That cistern will store rainwater. Well, this cistern is going to store the molecules that are made inside the endoplasmic reticulum. Right? In this case, these cisternae will store proteins, and down here, these cisternae uh, are going to store carbohydrates and lipids. Okay. Endoplasmic reticulum is also going to function to transport these molecules that are made through the cell. Okay. And the endoplasmic reticulum is also going to be able to detoxify substances drugs and toxins that are absorbed into the cells are going to be neutralized by enzymes that are contained within the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. Now, I mentioned the term cisternae. Uh, cisternae are these uh, hollow tubes and uh, flattened sheets inside the endoplasmic reticulum. And here we've got the two different types of endoplasmic reticulum. We've got the smooth down here where ribosomes are absent. They're going to be responsible for making carbohydrates and lipids. And we've got the rough endoplasmic reticulum up here that have the ribosomes in the rough ER, rough endoplasmic reticulum, because of the ribosomes are going to be responsible for making protein. Here we have the Golgi apparatus, and the Golgi apparatus to early anatomists looked like stacked dinner plates. Okay. Five or six flattened discs called cisternae make up the Golgi apparatus. Now, the Golgi apparatus is going to receive transport vesicles from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Here you can see transport vesicles attaching to the forming face of the Golgi apparatus. Now, once these transport vesicles bind to the Golgi apparatus, the Golgi apparatus is going to modify the contents of these transport vesicles. Remember, these are coming from the rough endoplasmic reticulum, so inside these transport vesicles are proteins. So the Golgi apparatus modifies and packages these proteins. The other functions of the Golgi apparatus, they're going to create cell membrane renewal vesicles. And what they're going to do is bind to the cell membrane 
in order to replace worn out pieces of cell membrane, right? This would be new membrane right here that surrounds these vesicles. And when these vesicles bind to the cell membrane, this membrane of the vesicle will get incorporated into the cell membrane. Another function of the Golgi apparatus is to create lysosomes. And lysosomes are going to essentially be packages of special enzymes. Here's a slide that deals with lysosomes. Here in this picture, you can see the Golgi apparatus looking like stacked dinner plates. And the Golgi apparatus on this maturing face is going to form a lysosome. Right? This lysosome is going to have one of three fates. Okay. Now these lysosomes contain enzymes and what they can do is break down and recycle damaged organelles. So that's this fate right here. Here's an old worn out mitochondrion that doesn't work anymore. This primary lysosome would bind to it and essentially digest it, break it down so that the components can be reused, reabsorbed by the cell and recycled so we can make new mitochondria. The things that are not needed, the waste products, those would be excreted or ejected from the cell through the process of exocytosis, where this membrane-bound vesicle would bind to the cell membrane so that the contents can be released to the outside of the cell. Lysosomes can also break down things that are taken into the cell. Right? Here we can see the cell engulfing some extracellular substance. It could be a solid, it could be a fluid, but it engulfs it through the process of endocytosis. Okay? Now, that's where something comes into the cell, and it comes in through a membrane-bound vesicle, and the primary lysosome could bind to that vesicle, the enzymes inside could break that substance down in the nutrients or components that the cell could use could be absorbed into the cell and the wastes could be discarded from the cell through the process of exocytosis. Another thing that can happen with these lysosomes is those lysosomes could break open and the enzymes could be released throughout the cytoplasm of the cell and those enzymes could digest the inside of the cell which would kill the cell. Right? This is called autolysis. Next up we have the mitochondria. Now the mitochondria are often known as the powerhouse of the cell. Right? What does that mean, powerhouse of the cell? What it means is the mitochondria are going to be responsible for producing ATP. And you can see ATP being produced here in this picture. Okay. Now, the mitochondria consists of a double membrane structure. Okay. Here we can see the outer membrane right here containing all of this stuff. And then there's an inner membrane that's thrown into folds. Okay. These folds are called cristi. Okay. And those folds are going to increase the surface area on this inner membrane so that we can attach more and more enzymes to that inner membrane. Right? Remember, whenever we have folds in a membrane, that's to increase the surface area so we can add more proteins into that membrane. And those proteins are going to be responsible for doing things. They could be absorbing things into a cell, or in this case, they could be important for making ATP, or important for producing energy. So we've got a double membrane structure here, and like I said, the inner folds are called cristi, and there's enzymes on those inner folds. Okay? And those enzymes are going to be responsible for producing ATP. And we'll look at some of the details of ATP production later on when we study metabolism. We'll get to that when we get to the skeletal muscle. This is another picture of a mitochondrion. And here you can see how the mitochondrion works. 
The mitochondrion is going to take in two things. It's going to take in pyruvic acid, and it's also going to take in oxygen. Now, both of those things are going to help to produce ATP through a series of complicated chemical reactions. Chemical reactions that happen in the matrix inside the mitochondrion. That's essentially the cytoplasm right here inside the mitochondrion. And also chemical reactions that happen in these enzymes on the cristae. All right, so the pyruvic acid comes in and goes through the tricarboxylic acid cycle or the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, whatever name you want to use here, right? And then goes through the electron transport chain, which is on the cristae, and ATP will be produced from this. Okay, also a byproduct of this cellular respiration would be carbon dioxide and this carbon dioxide needs to be dealt with by the body and discarded from the body okay otherwise if carbon dioxide stays in the body it increases the acidity of the body fluids which can of course alter the function of the body okay so mitochondria will absorb pyruvic acid and oxygen and generate our friend ATP and carbon dioxide. Now next up we've got the nucleus. And like I said, I like to think about the nucleus as being like the library inside the cell. Right? I know some people refer to the nucleus as being the brains of the cell. Right? That could be true if um, you think of the nucleus as being the um, uh, place where the memories of your ancestors are stored. The nucleus is going to be responsible for storing DNA, it, and DNA is essentially blueprints to make proteins. The nucleus is surrounded by a nuclear envelope, right, which is a double membrane structure, and there's little holes in this nuclear envelope called nuclear pores. We'll see the importance of the nuclear pores when we look at protein synthesis. Okay. Now, Nucleoli, or a nucleolus, is a structure inside the nucleus that's going to make ribosomal RNA. Okay? Now remember, when we looked at the ribosomes a few slides ago, the ribosomes were made up of 60% ribosomal RNA. Most of a ribosome is made up of ribosomal RNA. So it could be said that the nucleolus, because of this, makes ribosomes, right? And that's generally accepted is the case. Okay? So nucleoli make ribosomes. Chromosomes are places in the nucleus that will store the DNA, that will store the genes, okay? We've got 23 pairs of chromosomes, and on those chromosomes will be the DNA, and the DNA is organized into genes, and each gene will code for a specific protein. I like to view the nucleus as being like the library. Okay? If you want to make a protein for whatever reason, right, the blueprints are stored in here. So you access the blueprints in order to build the protein. Just like a library, let's say you wanted to know how to build a house, right? So you go to the library to look at a library book that tells you how to build a house. But think of this, you can't take that book out of the library. So what you have to do is make a copy of that book with a copy machine or write it out, write out a copy onto your notebook paper, and then take that information out of the library so that you can use it to build your house right the same sort of thing is in play here in our cells where if we want to make a protein we go to the library which is the nucleus we look at the blueprints which are the genes to make specific proteins we can't take those books out of the library so we have to make a copy 
that's a messenger RNA molecule, we take that copy outside the nucleus so that we can build our protein, just like we took our copy of our book out of the library to build our house before. So second messenger system, the way a second messenger system, let me introduce the players first. We've got a receptor right here. We also have a G protein right here. We're going to have another membrane bound protein over here called adenylate cyclase. Okay. And we can see down here a series of chemical reactions that are going to take place. So let's go through this. The second messenger system. Some sort of extracellular molecule, a ligand, specifically let's say that this is a hormone. A hormone binds to a receptor, which is a membrane-bound protein. Okay? This hormone comes from the outside of the cell. This hormone is floating around in the external environment of the cell. And it finds this receptor and finds a nice active site for it to bind to, and it does. And once it binds to that receptor, it changes the physiology inside the cell. It changes the chemical reactions inside the cell. Okay. Now, once the hormone, in this case, binds to the receptor, it's going to activate a G protein, some sort of intracellular protein, often it's a G protein, and it gets activated. And what this G protein is going to do is bind to adenylate cyclase, which is another membrane-bound protein. Okay? And when it binds to adenylate cyclase, what it's going to do is promote the formation of cyclic AMP. Okay? Now, this is the second messenger in the second messenger system. What was the first messenger? That was the hormone, the ligand that bound to the receptor. Okay, so the cyclic AMP, once cyclic AMP is created, it's going to activate some sort of kinases, all right, which are enzymes. Right? And those enzymes are going to change the physiology inside the cell. Right? They could activate another series of enzymes which could access the nucleus where the plans for protein synthesis are stored, the DNA, access those plans in order to make a protein that could be released from the cell to have an effect someplace else in the body. Right? So the external environment is going to drive the function of the cell through the cell membrane the cell membrane is going to activate a series of chemical reactions that would access the nucleus, controlling the nucleus, so that a protein can be made to be released from the cell. Right? It's almost like the nervous system taking in information and formulating some sort of response. We're at the point where we talk about protein synthesis. Before we talk about the actual process of protein synthesis, we need to go over a few things. Right? One of those things is the genetic code. Okay? And the code is stored in this nucleic acid known as deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. Okay? Now, the DNA, like I mentioned many times before, is going to form the blueprint for protein synthesis. When we want to make a protein, we need to access a gene which codes for a specific protein. Okay. Now, the DNA is organized into structures called chromosomes, and we've got 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, 23 from the mother and 23 from the father. And DNA consists of two strands of nucleotides. Two strands, so DNA is a, a double-stranded nucleic acid, one on each side here. Right? These two strands are bound in the middle by hydrogen bonds. Now, like I mentioned before, the code is stored in the DNA, and it's stored actually in the sequence 
of nitrogenous bases, and we're going to see the importance of this in a minute. Okay. The code is a triplet code or a codon, and what a codon is is three consecutive nitrogenous bases. This GAG would be a codon or a triplet code, and what that's going to do is code for a single amino acid. Okay. The TGT would code for cysteine, for example. Okay. Now, a gene is going to have a series of triplet codes or codons that will code for a string of amino acids, which would essentially be a protein. So genes are going to code for specific proteins. Okay. They t contain all of the DNA triplets or triplet codes or codons needed to produce specific proteins. Okay. Now, this next slide, please don't memorize this, but this next slide right here shows us the triplet codes. We're dealing here with RNA, however, because we've got uracil instead of thymine. But this chart right here shows the triplet codes that are going to code for specific amino acids. Okay, So, for example, a UUU -U -U would code for phenylalanine. Right. A UCU would code for serine. Okay. Uh, let's see, if we wanted to code for leucine, we could uh, have a CUA code or any of these other ones, CUU, CUC, uh, CUA, CUG. Okay. Uh, let's see, if we wanted to code for uh, arginine, for example, we could have an AGA -A code that codes for that specific amino acid. Okay? You can also see there are codons to tell us when to stop making the protein. If we come across a codon that is a UAA, that signifies that we stop making the protein. If we come across a codon that says UAG, that signifies we stop making the protein and so on. Okay, So these are the triplet codes that code for the specific amino acids. Okay. Now, the process of protein synthesis is broken up into three steps. Right? Now, I'm going to go through this process of protein synthesis, and what I'm going to do is simplify it greatly. Okay? Remember, this is kind of an introductory course, introduction into anatomy and physiology. So um, I'm going to try to simplify this as best I can so that it's easier for you to learn. If you want to know all the details, consult the textbook. It'll do, it does a nice job at explaining all the details of protein synthesis, but what I've done is try to simplify it so it's easier for you to understand. Okay? So three steps in the process of protein synthesis. The first step is gene activation. Okay? So what's happening here is we're going to have an enzyme called RNA polymerase. And what that RNA polymerase is going to do is unzip the DNA. Okay, here's our DNA right here. We need to unzip it so that we can access these nitrogenous bases to look at the triplet codes. So the RNA polymerase comes in, binds to the gene at the control segment or the start segment, the start codon. Right. binds to it there, and what it's going to do is unzip the DNA strand, separate the two nucleic acids in order to access the triplet codes or the codons. And what the RNA polymerase is going to do next is make a copy of the DNA strand. Okay. These are the blueprints. This is the book right here that can't leave the library. So what's going to have to happen is we have to make a copy that we can take out of the library to use to make a protein. Okay. So the next step is 
transcription. And what we do when we transcribe something is we make a copy. And this RNA polymerase is going to do this for us. So transcription is the formation of a molecule, a nucleic acid known as messenger ribonucleic acid or messenger RNA. And it's going to make it from the DNA strand. Okay. So RNA polymerase comes in and makes the messenger RNA. This is the copy of the blueprints that we can take outside the nucleus. Okay. M stands for messenger. Messenger RNA carries the instructions from the nucleus out into the cytoplasm where protein synthesis is going to continue. Okay. So here we can see the messenger RNA strand going through one of those nuclear pores out into the cytoplasm. And what's going to happen is the small ribosomal subunit is going to bind to this messenger RNA strand at the start codon. And then what's going to happen after that is the large ribosomal subunit will bind to surround this messenger RNA strand, this copy, so it can read it and start adding amino acids to it. Okay. Now how the amino acids are added is these transfer RNA molecules, tRNA, T stands for transfer, these transfer RNA molecules are going to bring in amino acids to add to the string of amino acids to make a protein. Now, in order to come in and bring in a specific amino acid in a specific sequence, the transfer RNA is going to have an anticodon, and that anticodon has to match the codon on the messenger RNA strand. Okay. But it's going to have to mirror the codon on the messenger RNA strand. Okay. The A's are going to bind to U's and the C's and G's will bind. Okay. So this anticodon will bind to this codon right here, bringing in the first amino acid. Okay. Here we're going to bring in a second amino acid. This anticodon right here is going to match this codon right here, bind to this codon, bringing in the next amino acid in the sequence for this protein. And then this ribosome is going to continue to move down this messenger RNA strand, adding more amino acids because more transfer RNAs are going to bind at these codons to bring in specific amino acids in this sequence so that we can make a specific protein. Okay, So messenger RNA codons are going to designate for specific amino acids to be added specifically in the specific sequence, specifically. <laughs> right? And the codons are going to match the anticodons of the transfer RNA. Okay? Now this next slide right here continues the process of translation. You can see how the ribosome is going to move down the messenger RNA strand. Right? This first transfer RNA is going to get kicked off when it adds its amino acid to make room for another transfer RNA to bind at this codon right here with its anticodon in order to bring in the next amino acid in the sequence. Right? Once we hit the stop codon, Right, once the ribosome hits the stop codon, that's going to signify that we stop making the protein, and this complex is going to separate okay, so that we can have our protein that's been produced be released so that it can do its folding that it has to do in order to have its specific characteristics and do its specific job someplace in the cell or get packaged to go outside the cell. Okay. But this is how we make proteins. This is how our cells make proteins. Again, this is actually more complex than what I described, but you get the gist of it.